Hi, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. Uh, my name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore. And I'm so pleased today to be joined by Kimberly McCrae here to discuss her fantastic new book, A Good Marriage, uh, in conversations with Laura Sims. Um, we're especially happy to be able to reach you in all the, the, the comforts of your home uh, and to be hosting an author who has been a great supporter and friend of our store for so many years. Um, we are coming up on our 50th anniversary next year, and now more than ever in these strange times, we want to live up to our name as a community. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, uh, please click on the Ask a Question button, which is just right here down at the bottom, um, and you can submit a question that way. We are going to try to get through as many of those at the end of the program as possible. And um, while you're looking down there, uh, you'll see a green purchase the book here button, very important, um, where you can navigate to our website to purchase a copy of A Good Marriage to the Bookstore. Um, for every book purchased through us tonight, uh, Kim is gonna send along a limited edition Good Marriage tote. So that is a bonus for you. Um, and then so a caveat for tonight's event and all virtual events right now, um, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise during the program. Uh, we'll try to solve them very quickly. You know, fingers crossed, everything is gonna go swimmingly. Uh, and finally, we're adding more virtual programming every week. Um, there's a link to sign up for our newsletter if you click on the title of this event right up here. Um, one that I do wanna mention happening next Thursday, we're hosting Bethany Saltman with National Book Award winner Andrew Solomon to discuss parenting in this time of crisis. Um, you can register for that program by navigating to our store profile over there at the top. A lot of pointing to where things are on the screen. Um, so a little about our presenters tonight, and then I'm out of here. Uh, Kim is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Reconstructing Amelia, which was nominated for the Edgar, Anthony, and Alex Awards and the USA Today bestseller, Where They Found Her. She attended Vassar College and graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two daughters. And Laura's debut novel, Looker, was published to critical acclaim in early 2019 and was named a Best Novel of the Year by Vogue, Esquire UK, and Crime Reads, among many other outlets. Uh, she's also published four books of poetry, including most recently, Staying Alive, and her poetry and prose have appeared in The New Republic, Boston Review, Conjunctions, Gulf Coast, and many other journals. She lives in New Jersey with her family. We all live on the internet right now. So, Kim and Laura, the stage is yours. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, guys. Um, Kim, would you like to start everything off by reading a little bit from this awesome book? <laughs> yes, I, I will. I'll stop by reading. Um, I first just want to say a quick thank you to Community Bookstore for um, for doing this event. Um, they have stepped up in such an amazing way, which is no surprise because they're such a, a pivotal part of the Park Slope community. Um, and I have loved being able to hold my launches there over the years. Um, so it, it's really incredible the way they managed to adapt despite all the limitations. Um, and I wanna thank you for doing this. Um, I have to say for everybody out there who's not an author, there are few tasks more thankless than kind of being the interviewer um, in one of these things. So I just wanna say that Laura's book Looker is unbelievable. I was raving about it to her before we went live and I've just been reading it and you should all buy that book because it um, it did set my hair on fire. Uh, it's brilliant. So um, anyway, so I just want to start by saying that because then I will get nervous and I will forget to say any of this later. Um, so I'm going to start by, um, I am going to read just a little bit, um, not of the narrative chapters. The book is, um, you know, let me tell you a little bit about what the book is about before I um, before I start reading it. So it's um, it's set in in Park Slope, <laughs> like the community bookstore, um, and where I live. Uh, it takes place over one week in the summer when most of the kids are gone at sleepaway camp, and their parents are gearing up for the event of the summer, which is an adults only sexually adventurous party. Um, and um, it, it's adventurous but fun. The party is always meant to be just fun. But this year after the party, a woman ends up dead and her husband is quickly accused and arrested. And he reaches out to a former law school classmate for help named Lizzie. She's an outsider to the neighborhood. And as she's drawn into Park Slope, she quickly realizes that neither her friend nor his wife um, or who they appear to be, but then neither is her own husband. Um, so the book is really part legal thriller, part domestic suspense, but it's also meant to be a genuine exploration of what it means to sustain a marriage over time. 
and the couple, the secrets some couples keep and the compromises they make in order to stay together. Um, so that's a little background. So it's narrated from the perspectives of Lizzie, um, who's the attorney um, in the present day after the, the death um, and after her, the husband has been arrested. And then from the perspective of Amanda, who's a woman who dies and it's in the days leading up to that party. Um, and it also has uh, transcript excerpts from grand jury testimony, as well as some corporate documents um, and some journal entries. So it's got, as Reconstruct Amelia did, it has a bit of an orchestral um, structure uh, to it. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of the grand jury testimony. Um, in general, I, I hate reading and I think on, <laughs> on, on a platform like this, it's even more totally boring. Um, so I'll try to make it really short. Um, but the uh, one thing I will say is because this is going out to Park Slope folks, if you have a young child in the room, this is probably not necessarily the best um, excerpt for them to listen to. It's short though, so they can do earmuffs. Earmuffs will work because it's super short. It's not like X-rated or something, don't worry, but it's, um, it. Uh, yeah, so they probably shouldn't listen. Anyway, um, so again, it's grand jury testimony. Um, Lucy Delgado called as a witness the 6th of July and was examined and testified as follows by Ms. Wallace. She's the prosecutor. Ms. Delgado, thank you for being willing to testify. I was subpoenaed. And thank you for complying with that subpoena. Were you at a party at, a, at 724 First Street on July 2nd of this year? Yes. And how did you come to be at that party? I was invited. By whom were you invited? Maud Lego. And how do you and Maud Lego know each other? Years ago, our daughters were in the same kindergarten class at Brooklyn Country Day. This party is an annual event, is it not? I don't know. You don't know? No. Let's try this another way. Have you been to this party in previous years? Yes. What happens at this party? Um, socializing, eating, drinking, it's a party. An adult party? Yes. Kids aren't invited. Anyway, most of them are at sleepaway camp or summer immersion or whatever. That's the point of the party, sleepaway soiree, get it? I do. And does sexual intercourse take place at these parties? What? Does sexual intercourse take place on the upstairs floor during this party? I have no idea. You are under oath. You do recall that, correct? Yes. I'll ask the question again. Does sexual intercourse take place on the upstairs floor during the sleepaway soiree at 724 First Street? Sometimes. Not actually on the floor. There are beds. It's a regular house. Have you ever engaged in sexual intercourse during these parties? No. Have you, you had sexual relations of any kind during these parties? Yes. With your husband? No. With somebody else's husband? Yes. Did others engage in similar behavior? Sometimes. Not everyone and not all the time. It's not that big of a deal. Partner swapping wasn't a big deal to the people at this party. Partner swapping sounds so, I don't know, purposeful or something. This was only fun, like a joke, sort of. A way to blow off steam. Did you see Amanda Grayson at the party on July 2nd? Yes, but I didn't know who she was at the time. How did you learn that you'd seen her? The police showed me a picture of her. They showed you a picture of Amanda Grayson and asked if you'd seen her at the party? Yes. And where did you see her? In the living room. She bumped into me and spilled wine down my shirt. When was that? I think around 9.30 or 10 p.m. I don't know exactly, but I was only at the party until 11, so sometime before then. Did you see her again after that? No. How did she seem when you saw her? Upset. She seemed upset. Upset like crying or angry? Scared. She seemed really scared. Did you speak with Maud Lego at the party that night? I was going to talk to her, but when I went over, it seemed like she and her husband Sebi were arguing about another woman. Why do you say that? Because I heard Maud say something about naked pictures of her and she was really, really angry. I mean, I'd never seen her like that before. Thank you very much, Ms. Delgado. You may step down. So that's it. Thank you, Kim. Yes. I, I love the work that those excerpts do in the book. Like it's very, it's in a very efficient way of getting some of the information that you need. Um, and it also allows for all these different voices that you don't necessarily hear elsewhere to come in. I really enjoyed that. Was that oh, something yeah. that you, like did in the first draft or was it a revision? You know, where in the process did those come in? 
Oh, well, thank you, first of all, for your description of it, because that's what I was hoping to accomplish with them. <laughs> um, and in fact, it was the kind of thing where you write a for no, they, they don't come at the beginning. Um, yeah. So yeah, I will have you drafted the entire book. And I'm like, okay, wait, so now, now you need to know these other things. Like, how am I going to tell you these other things? Because these two main characters don't know these things. Um, and you also need to know them earlier um, than you would find out, right? So how am I gonna get that in? And then you're like, I could introduce another character. I could introduce another you know, element, which is why in the end, so many of my books are written in this fashion because um, I realize afterwards that either emotionally, it's not complete, you know, like you, you don't have a, a real sense. Like I, I felt as though you needed to, to feel what it was like to be at that party pretty early on um, yeah. and to get a sense of the broader community, right? Because in some right. ways, um, both Lizzie and Amanda are outsiders yeah. to the community. So I wanted these other voices to to, um, to bring you in a little bit um, and you know to give you some sense of, and they also do fun work in terms of you see those, you see the scenes mentioned in the transcripts later actually mm -hmm. play out um, and you get to, so it's like a little bit of like a, you know, whatever, like an Easter egg hunt kind of thing where you see, you're like, oh wait, that's the thing I read about at the beginning. You see those moments right. later. So right. it's just meant to be a little, a nice nod to the reader um, that they get to see those moments come full circle. Yeah, I think it really works. Yeah, I, I kind of got ahead of myself. I wanted to, let me back up because I just wanted to say a little something about the book, um, which I just, I've had a hard time like really getting immersed in in, I mean, I'm reading a lot right now, but I've had a hard time like really getting immersed in my reading and like really escaping into a book and getting carried away. And this book really, like I was so immersed in it for oh, seven nights. It was such a pleasure. It's like so well written, of course, and smart and um, just like emotionally rich and everything. And so I'm recommending to everybody that you should definitely get a copy of this. It's a perfect quarantine reading. I mean, it's, you know, Thank perfect you. reading anyway, but it's like really great for right now. I feel like it will really take you out of, out of yourself and out of our crappy situation. <laughs> yes. well, thank you. I mean, for sure, like, I first and foremost, do want you to be like swept up. I mean, obviously there's a lot of different things I'm trying to do, but I do think, you know, as a storyteller, I really do, like I care about the mystery part of it and the, the yeah. you know, page turning part of it. And I think that's a lot of fun. So um, I, I'm glad to hear that. That's good. Yeah, and speaking of you doing a lot of things, I mean, the book does so many things. Um, you know, I think you mentioned yourself, like, yes, it's a legal thriller, but it's also like domestic suspense. It's also a book about women's friendships. It's a book about the secrets, like you said, the secrets that we might keep even from ourselves that can kind of haunt us. And um, so it does, it's doing so many things. Um, and one of those things that it's really focusing on is marriage. And so I was wondering why write a book about marriage? It's really exploring, you know, many different facets of marriage, which I loved was one of the things I really loved about the book. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, why? I mean, I think it's just, to me, it's a, um, a fascinating, um, just institution. You know, I grew up in a family where um, my parents divorced at a really young age, so I didn't grow up in a in a household where there was like a a, a marriage, you know, <laughs> intact. Um, so I kind of come to. I'm married myself. I've been married mm -hmm. for a lot of years, and so um, I am always kind of astounded. I I feel a little bit like you know, just like a traveler, like in a foreign country, where I'm like, what? Like this is. <laughs> ridiculous like ridiculous thing we are all doing um and especially when i'm with like i, I just never take anything as self-evident like mm -hmm. to you know, as like a truth um i tend not to to believe those you know whatever those those platitudes people say about various institutions whether it's motherhood or or marriage or anything yeah. else um so i and particularly now that you know my friends our friends have been married a, a long time i think it's fascinating when you spend time with other couples because no matter how close you are with the individual like you know when some of your closest friends you see them with their spouse and you're like 
what is that like inside? Like when they go home, like, you know, do they actually like each other or <laughs> do they really hate each other? Or like what, because every, every marriage is so different. I feel like you have two people and then you have this thing, this living thing that exists between them, right? That either lives or dies or, or, or changes over time. Yeah. Um, and so the answer to that question, because both people are always changing and the, the relationship between them is always changing. It's not even static for one couple. I mean, you can see the changes when you've known people for many years. Um, and so I, I don't know, I just became really interested in it. And I think there are a lot of books, particularly mysteries that, yeah. that um, because whatever I'm going to do, it's going to always end up being a mystery and someone's probably going to end up dead because I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> down myself. So it's, it's going to, that was definitely going to happen. So um, then I think there's a lot of mysteries if you're in that kind of space where yeah. it's about like the secrets of a husband keeps from a wife and they really hate each other and they whatever. And I was like, but what about the, the secrets couples keep from the world? But not even like we are secretly, you know, killing people in our house, but like right. the more subtle ones and even the ones they don't realize they're keeping, yeah. which I think is a really a truism, right? The longer you are married, um, because life gets complicated, you have children, you have jobs, you move, you know, like there's, there's so many things we're all rocketing through in the world, um, in our lives. Um, and then there's this marriage, right? That's like potentially just like this, this kind of river running, you know, you're riding on top of. And um, I think it's really interesting. A lot of time you're not paying attention to it. Um, mm -hmm. And and what is it, you know? And you can be staying together um, and that, that doesn't necessarily, mean everything. And so I, I did want to like examine the notions we have about what what makes a good marriage um, and how some of them are just really just so black and white in a really, you know, false way. Um, like always be 100% honest and or, you know, fidelity, you have to, you know, the an, on marriage requires absolute fidelity. That's the only model you could possibly live by. And right. I just think any rules like that are just fundamentally kind of ridiculous. And so um, the the parallel I drew with the legal system, yeah. I think that's an institution, right? Mm -hmm. um, where we kind of set up the same dynamic. People are guilty or innocent. Mm -hmm. um, the prosecution and defense are good or bad. Um, and things are all very clear. And and um, if you re read the book, you will see that like nothing, none of that is true, right? Like, so, you know, there are people trying to do good who do bad. Um, there are people who are quote unquote innocent, but also guilty. Um, and so I really wanted to create a parallel between um, the institution of marriage and, and, and the institution of the law um, and see what happens if you kind of turn some of those notions on their head and, and really um, examine them. And, you know, it's a scary thing. That's why people don't do it. <laughs> because if you suddenly, if things aren't black and white, then what are they? Right. Um, and, but I think it's important because I think underneath all of that is where like the truth of happiness lies. Yeah. So your, your image cut out, I don't know. Ooh but I can still hear you. So I think okay. everyone can hear you. So I guess we'll just keep going um, and, and probably it'll just pop back on. Okay. Um, I'm just making a note that it is it is live for me. So okay. I, think, I think that it's probably just internet connections. I'm back it, out. Bye. Okay, okay, good. Um, so you mentioned that you probably any book that you wrote, there would be a murder or something. There'd be a mystery, sorry. Um, and I was wondering if, if you were thinking about genre when you were writing the book, did you think like, oh, this is gonna be a domestic suspense novel or did, this is gonna be a legal, um, you know, were you conscious of that or was it something that just kind of happened naturally as you went along? I think, I mean, I think it's really hard for any writer to really think about genre that clearly, right? Like you're trying to do so many things yeah. when, you, when you start out, you know, um, writing a story. so. Yeah. No, um, not uh, very. And my things have always crossed over. Um, like Amelia was, yeah. when it first came out, it was like women's fiction crossing over a little like a more, slightly more literary women's fiction. No one like at the time thought it was really a mystery. Right. Um, so, you know, now it's different. Once you've had, had a few books, obviously you start to get defined, your work starts to get defined a, a little bit more. Um, and also you start to learn who you are more as, as a writer, yeah. um, right? right. So, so that's a piece of it too. So I will say that the, the, 
the landscape of domestic suspense um, yeah. is different than it was when I wrote Amelia. That was kind of like, you know, right, Gone Girl had had just come out and yeah. um, that it was a new thing, right? That, that we were doing this like domestic suspense, it's a bit literary and like, what is it? Um, and so the landscape's quite different now. There's, there's it's like a huge amount kind of, of work published in this space. So yeah. I feel like, you know, by the way, no matter how you try to determine what something's going to be, the, the marketplace of the world tells you it's something else, you know? Right. So, um, right. you know, I, I was aware that, um, there was this legal thriller part of it, obviously, mm -hmm. because I knew, and I, I did want to kind of do that because I thought that would be fun. Um, and I also thought something, it was something I, I, that I was uniquely equipped to do. Because you have a law degree, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so um, <laughs> that I spent a lot of money for um, myself. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know, it would be really nice to get my money's worth. Um, let's try to use that. But, but it, the, really, like part of the way, the reason I ended up in law school was because I loved like legal entertainment, you know, like any kind of law television show or John Grisham as like, oh, you know, right. I uh -huh. like I loved that stuff. That was how I thought that I know it sounds absolutely asinine, but it would be a lie to say that isn't partly how I ended up in law school. And a lot um, of people probably. Yeah. So, um, of course it's not like that. Um, so the really fun part is I, now I get to like make it like that. Um, right. so, um, I hope that, I hope that, that mine also brings through though, of course. Um, but wow. yeah, so, so I did, I, I was, I, and I, you know what, the, the best part of, of the law really like in the learning of it in law school, like law school itself is great, but it's really the puzzle aspect of it. Um, and so, even though this is part legal thriller because there are lawyers in it and legal issues, it's also part legal thriller because it's structured a bit like a legal argument. Um, and I was aware of that as I was writing it because you you kind of, when you write a mystery, you you present an argument and you have to really predict the counter argument um, as you're doing it. And the counter argument being what the reader is going to think. Um, and this isn't to set up the reader as my adversary, uh, right. but they are a bit in, in this circumstance. So you're all the time trying to, you know, lay facts down and then think of what they're going to think and then predict around that um, as you build yeah. red herrings. So um, it was fun to both have the law in it, but really lean into that, that part of the storytelling. Yeah. It felt to me very different from like other legal thrillers that I've read or seen. Um, it felt, to me, it felt a lot more realistic. Not that I necessarily know what's realistic or not, but <laughs> it, did <Excellent>. feel, <laughs> it did feel more realistic. I think I mentioned to you, like, instead of kind of crescendoing in this big, you know, trial, and that's where everything comes out, which I feel is part of that genre, um, like the more typical kind of genre move to make like that spoiler alert doesn't happen in the book mm -hmm. um, but there's plenty of other ways that yeah the law and and these legal moves and documents come in that i i don't know i just found it really fascinating yeah well thank you yeah i mean again because i didn't think and i don't i'm not well enough read like in the specific genre of legal thriller to even know yeah. what which is which is good. I mean, like sometimes I hear this less. Yeah. Like I don't. I'm like I don't know. If this is how. I mean, I, I I said it where I said it because I um, had to accomplish certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I knew you're you're a bit boxed in by like I knew I didn't couldn't have a trial. Like if he's going to be arrested, what I was going to have my book. People don't go to trial for years. Right. <laughs> so like I, I'm going to have my book span over years. Like I, I knew that um, there were certain limitations and ways yeah. I wanted to tell the story. Um, right. And then again, the, the helpful that I was a lawyer because I knew enough to know I, what I had to figure out. Because I was like, oh wait, but you know, there's these limitations. And from there, I had to consult like like an army of experts because I was a corporate litigator. I was not a criminal attorney, so um, I didn't know. I don't know the ins and outs of of criminal law at all. Um, but you know, so I consulted people, and they helped fill in some of the, a lot of those blanks for me. Oh, that's cool. And you know, I was wondering um, what. Were there were there specific books or films or TV shows that inspired this book, or what was the what was the inspiration or the starting point for you for this book? You know, again, I really think the starting point was just 
that idea about marriage. Um, oh. You know, I think there was <laughs> there was one specific story that the sex party, you know, came from a oh. specific story. Um, it's not the party I have at my house every every year. It's a different party. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I will invite you later, though, Laura. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, there there were specifics that that kind of inspired that piece of it, and that yeah. and that to me is a fun is a fun part of the story. It's not. Yeah. Um, it could be a stand-in. That party could be a stand-in for a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, I think it 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 serves one purpose in this book. Um, but but again, I think it's emblematic of of whatever you know, risky behavior that you know a lot of people end up engaging in once they've been married a long time. Um, so uh, really, the the honestly, the starting place was really that question of, of marriage and and yeah. what it means and what it is. Um, and so from there usually like the the small pieces of the story the different twists and turns will be inspired by small specific things again the party you know the party kind of came from one place and then like there are other as you know there, there's a hacking aspect and and that came from um a story somebody had told me about somebody having access to the um the school list a school list um and, and somebody using it in an inappropriate way at a private school so like you can see how you kind of gather all those threads which i'm generally i think most novelists are um which is why you should never tell me anything um but i'm always like i'm gonna keep that i'm gonna use that later yeah. um, and it usually comes out in some twisted i told the person who whatever gave me that thread about the list um, that I had used it, and it's like unrecognizable now. But I'm like, no, right. but that's your thing that you told me. I know it looks different, but that's that's it. Um, <laughs> so for sure, there are people in the book that are definitely inspired by by real people, um, you know. And again, they tend to be combined and turned around, so you don't right. necessarily recognize yourself. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, it's gener It's definitely not. Um, and because. Part of that's because I don't know the story when I start out to write it. I don't outline, yeah. and so it would be hard. I'll, you know, I just have this vague sense of this idea I want to explore, um, right. which, given how intricately they're plotted, is not the best best method. <laughs> would probably be good to outline in advance, but I don't know how to. So um, I just sit down and start to write. So I really just kind of get yeah. my character. Like I got Amanda, and then I was like, well, she's not going to be able to to do the work of the story because she's an out, you know, she's just, she's not alive. So we need somebody else. And then Lizzie, the Lizzie and Zach relationship kind of came to me um, fully formed and it was clear she would be the guide into the story. So it comes that way. And then I just write my way into it. So oh. and I, do you, sorry, yeah. do you pause yeah. at any point and, and outline or organize or plan things? You just keep going. I just keep going and I never like Okay. Back. Yeah. Um, which again is a terrible idea on some levels. I mean, you can imagine like the draft. I mean, the draft I end up with is is like a horror show. I mean, it's when it's done, you know. I can I can relate to that. Yeah. So I mean, it's, you, you know, like people either fall into two camps. You're an outliner or you're a pantser yeah. or whatever. Like you, you kind of can't change the way you do it. It's just the way yeah. you do it. If you're an outliner, I think you're doing the, the work up front and um, that I just can't do it without, it's so weird. It's like without the physical action of my hands on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And I see it yeah. like a movie when I'm writing and I have to just kind of be in the scene and see it. Yeah. And um write the scenes um and i do the one thing i do do is as i'm writing it i start keeping um start keeping something of a working outline right when i get far enough along i don't know if you do this too but kind of like i start to realize things yeah i'm just like yeah. go back and make so and so nicer or go back and make them not dead or you know like yeah. something um and sure. i do that um because at a certain point, as a story starts to gel, um, but the the real work of me finding the story comes in the um, my first couple rounds of revision. Um, like this book, I probably rewrote the entire thing ten or twelve times before I submitted it. Um, wow. So, agent. yeah, you submitted it to your agent. Okay, before I submitted it, yeah, to I or maybe I made it was and this was an unusual circumstance. It kind of got submitted to everyone at one time, but. Okay. Um, yeah. So before I submitted it for anybody to look at, and then there's a whole, there was a very extensive, my, my editor and agent are like, and then we just revised it so much after that too. Oh just, my God. How long did it all take? Like um, you know, the, it was like 18 months, I guess, from okay. the time I wrote the beginning um, until 
it came out, you know, like, you know, we were until whatever was out of my hands and took into right. copy. Um, right. okay. So, you know, my first draft is very fast, right? So like when you like just write really shitty, it's like yeah. can go super fast because I'm yep. just like, <laughs> you know, just keep going. I've Don't worked. Just, yeah. You know. um, the key, maybe not for everybody, but that seems to be the case for me too. Is like, yeah, just get it all down. Yeah, because it's yeah. so much otherwise. I mean, I have friends, I don't know if you do this, but I have friends who open up their computer every day and look at what they wrote the day before. Do you do that? I, I go back a little bit just to get back Remember. in. Right. But I don't go all the way back. I know some people. I mean, I would be like, this is terrible. I'm going to throw the whole thing out. This is go on. It can't go on. No. What's the point? I'm just going to set my computer on fire. I maybe burn down my house because this is terrible. Um, yeah, so... And you do have that moment, unfortunately. Like if you don't look back, you still get that moment, but it comes yeah. later when the whole thing's written, but then it's too late because you wrote the That's whole thing. Right. That's so right. You, you know, you have to fix it then. You have to fix it. That's so true. Well, I was going to ask you um, before, I was going to ask you, who would you imagine, like who would be your dream person to adapt this and star in it? And then I saw your news. So I, I don't know if you want to share your, your news um, about the adaptation. Yeah, so it's being adapted by um, Blossom Films and Amazon um, Studios. And um, Blossom Films is Nicole Kidman's uh, production company. Uh, and um, right. David Farr, who wrote um, The Night Manager and Hannah right. is attached to Ooh. adapt it. Um, and Wonderful. he's an extremely gifted writer with a Shakespearean background, which sounds wow. like me. That's so yeah, no, I, so I'm thrilled. I mean, you know, it's, it's early days in that process, but that's actually the same, um, uh, Blossom, um, Nicole Kidman's company was adapted, um, optioned Amelia, reconstructing Amelia with HBO right. and they're still working on that. So, okay. um, yeah, so it, it, it's Great. nice to work with the, with the same people again. Yeah. yeah. So, um, perfect for Lizzie, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry. What's that? I, I think she's perfect for Lizzie for that role. I'm guessing that she would be Lizzie. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I think Nicole Kidman's pretty much perfect for anything. <laughs> so, but yes, no, she would be fantastic, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think she can, she can do no wrong in my eyes, oh, for yeah. sure. Totally. Um, one thing, another thing that I really loved about the book was the ending. And I do not say that lightly because. I, re I do read a lot of mysteries and thrillers and often I'm just enjoying a book so much and then I get to the end and it's so dumb, you know, it's like feels tacked on and like, it doesn't make sense. It came out of nowhere. It was so predictable that, you know, you want to throw the book across the room, but a good marriage and I will not of course, spoil anything, but I was just so satisfied by the ending. And I felt like it really came from the fabric of the story you were telling. It's smart and it's like both surprising and inevitable. And I just, I loved it. I was, I was really pleased. Um, and I was wondering if it was difficult to figure out the ending. Um, now that I know your process, it sounds like you wouldn't have like written it first and written to the ending. I was just wondering if it, did it change in the revision process? Did it stay the same? What right. I think that, right. I, well, first of all, thank you. Um, yeah. I do think that's the biggest compliment. And for sure with mysteries, the oh. hardest part is the end. I mean, you can set up any kind of wild nonsense you want, but at the end of the day, I was just answering your Q and A about this. You're like bluffing through a poker game, and now they're like, "All right, what are the fucking cards?" Um, and you have like, "There's nowhere to go." You're like, "Oh, uh oh." Um, so you had better have it worked out um, by the time you get there. Uh, so. But I, often the ending, you can imagine in the early drafts, isn't as elegant. Um, and I'll, I'm just like, so just like end there and then you figure out a way um, to thread it back back through. Um, and But I do think that's one advantage, honestly, of not outlining because I'm not tied to anything. And no. I, I am free to discover things as I go along. Um, and oftentimes I'm like, I thought this was gonna happen, but wait, like that thing just happened. Yeah. But I also really, really think it comes from character development. Um, and really making everything that happens 
really organic to the characters. And in, in, in a lot of those kind of the really more nuanced parts of the twist, those are what come in when I'm working with my agent and my editor in, in later stages. And um, they'll, they will point out things and be like, well, this doesn't, it like doesn't ring true or why is right. this happening? And then I like 99% of the time I'm like, well, that happens. I don't know, but that happens. And so then you have to be like, okay, but it is not landing right. So why is that? And then you have to spend a lot of time kind of reverse engineering and really thinking about, but why would the character do this? And why, why, why? And then, um, and then go back and thread that in, right? Whatever the answer to that question is, has to be threaded either into the story or into their character. Um, so, uh, but I, I really, it's scary that, I mean, it, it, it's revision scary. I mean, to really like be willing to rip your, cause you're like the whole thing, if I'm going to rip it apart, the whole thing's going like to dissolve like a sand castle. Right. Um, so you have to be willing to, to do that work, right. um, and really lift up every single rock. And, um, I can actually remember very late, uh, in this revision process, it's actually my film agent pointed out something, she had a question about something. And I went and looked at what she, she kind of just something, she's like this twist or this small thing didn't make sense. And I really looked just at that scene. So you're doing so many things. Yeah. Um, and in looking at that one thing she pointed out, she was right about the things she was pointing out. But I also noticed like some other pro, you know, like some other issue that it made me look at because you really just have to start going and looking at specific things when there's, you know, the plot really isn't just one twist, right? I mean, there's yeah. like, ten, like, you know, not 10, but maybe five or six significant right. ones together. That yeah. Come together. So, um, again, you can't do that all at once. You know, it's like, yeah, I was, you know, you're working with each one separately, um, and hope the timing of them, you know, works. And so it comes from many, many, it's very, I feel very tired talking about it actually. Yeah. Um, it's a, like, am I going to do this? I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. I feel like that's why, you know, editing and writing has to be such a collaborative process because it just takes more minds than one to catch all of that stuff and see things, right? You know, it's, it's very hard. Oh, absolutely. And I think in particular when you're writing a mystery, because you like you need people who don't know the way, right? Like don't know the twists, right? Like and and so you constantly have to be once you've you've used up your editorial team, then right. you have to go repeat. Like you then we've all fixed it. We were like, who can we find? Like by the end, who doesn't know? Because you're you're then arguing about like single sentences. Like, well, if yeah. you say this is this here, are people gonna know the whole like so to me, the very best mysteries, yeah. um, and I, I am with you, like that drives me crazy to get to um, the end of a mystery and either be like, well, that was obvious, or it's something that you could not possibly have known. They're like, it's person uh, Z who wasn't in the book. Look, right. never but could have passed. Yes. <laughs> right, oh. like they just entered off of, you know, stage left. Right. And here they are. <laughs> um, so that drives me like bonkers I know. Um, That's crazy. I, yeah so i the key for me is the way i want to feel when as a consumer but also i hope my readers feel is when you get to the end you're like shit like i didn't know that but i could have known that like yeah and then you can go back yeah um, and look at the little things that yeah. you were told um that you disregarded at the end of your book so i think you would okay. achieve that <laughs> okay. Excellent. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do. But th that is a delicate balance, obviously, because that's about. And readers are so different too. Yeah. Particularly exactly. when you cross, you know, when you cross genres, like yeah. uh, there's a there's a percentage of my um, uh, readers who are really really mystery mystery readers, like, yeah. and they just read for plot, like that. Right. Like they're there for you know, the fat, you know, they just want the details and the facts and the whatever. Um, and so, but then I have like uh, other readers who aren't, don't read so many mysteries and they read mine because it has the other stuff in it. So it's hard, difficult too, because you're trying to give enough details for different kinds of readers. Um, right. And that can be hard too. Yeah. Well, I have one last question before we take, you have quite a few questions coming in. So we'll switch to that in a minute, but I just wanted to talk 
for or ask you one more question, which is about how you're doing as a writer during lockdown and um, during our current crisis. Um, are you getting writing done? You know, there's kind of a lot of talk in the writing community, like, should you be trying to write? Can you write? Can you not write? How has that affected your creative output? Um, well, so I think, you know, my editor and agent are on this. So like, I'm doing great. I'm writing so much <laughs> and it's all good. It's not like the other first draft. It's so <laughs> What's that? Sorry. I said, it's not like the other first drafts. It's really good. This oh, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. I mean, I'm perfect. It's like quarantine. It's like, just changed me. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, like everyone deals with, with stress and anxiety and whatever differently. Um, actually work and writing is a great comfort to me. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen a lot of talk about like, oh, we shouldn't, you know, you don't have to be productive and you, or you do have to be productive. And I think that the truth is just like the point about marriage is like everyone should do what the hell yeah. that makes them feel yeah. better. <laughs> um, so for me, it actually makes me feel better to work. I feel less trapped in this moment and I can be looking ahead. I do also have a book due soon. Um, so okay. that, create some sense of um, urgency. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, that said, um, the things I have to do in order to write are really like, terrible because I have to wake up at absurd hours because I do have kids in my house. And, um, you know, it, <clears throat> so anyway, it is kind of like obscene and it doesn't, and then I get kind of crazy because I'm not sleeping at all. But um, it's not definitely, it's definitely not the best, best method. <laughs> For anything, but we're all balancing here, right? Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like for me to have the pages, yeah. it just it makes me feel better. Like otherwise, I'll feel like, oh my god, this period of time, I'm losing this period of time. Like again, I feel like everyone should do what makes them feel better. Um, and and writing and seeing forward progress in you there. Press. Yeah, and I actually was writing the book, and I was also working on writing a pilot, like separately. I was like, I'm gonna write all this stuff, and again, that's not because that's what people should be doing at all. I do not feel that way. Um, if it made me feel better not to write at all, I would do that. Um, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with our audience questions. Um, the first one is from Candy, and it is, hello, first, Oops. Oh, nope. That's switched. Okay. Okay. This is still candy. Okay. Are, there, are there any characters, stories, and or situations that have been based on your life or have personalities of people in your life? Yes. And I am not going to tell you which ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, listen, I think I'm sure this is true for you as a writer. Like everything you write to some extent is this weird amalgam and it's all your experience filtered through this weird lens of um of things i will say that there's one character in the book i don't know if she's watching tonight but my my friend victoria who is a friend from law school who just like really appears fully formed in the book as as the main character's friend um there's some details about victoria are different but she remains my entertainment lawyer <laughs> to oh, this day she worked on that deal with nicole kidman um yeah. so you know i just put her in there. And I think at first to put her in there as a placeholder, because sometimes I, I find it easier to get an emotional connection, especially to a small character who has a, you know, like if you give them some, if you have some personal connection to them. Um, but then I was like, oh, I'm just gonna leave her in there. Like I can change her name. So it's yeah. like, you know, she's doing things that she wouldn't do, but it shares, she shares a lot of personality traits with my, with my actual friend. So um, yeah. yeah, but by and large, the larger characters, Lizzie, the main character wow. has a lot in common with me. Um, again, not in the specifics. I mean, we both went right. to Penn Law, went to Penn Law not, um, and not the specifics of, of her growing up. But like really that kind of core of her person, which actually made her the hardest character to write. I, I find, I don't know about you, but um, when a character is closer to me and personality, I think it's hard to separate them from you. And yeah. um, she was at the beginning, one of the less nuanced characters. Um, and I realized it was because I was making assumptions about what people would know, because it's really self-evident to me because I'm like that, you know, I'm like, well, you know, you get it, right? And people are like, no, because <laughs> you know, not her. Um, so uh, I had to spend time, and now she's less like me, right? So I went okay. to go in and put that nuance in. Um, but and Sam is a um, 
is an alcoholic, her husband is an alcoholic. I am a recovered or recovering. I realize I keep saying recovered. I don't think you're supposed to say recovered. Right. <laughs> I think frowns upon that. Um, so recovering um, alcoholic. So so a lot of his, um, I was able to write about that because of my own kind of personal okay. background. Um, but yeah. again, my experience with that didn't look anything like his, Yeah. You know, in the details. Um, but you're able to draw, I think, upon your personal experience to make a connection that character. Great. Okay, next question from Motoko Rich. Um, Motoko! <laughs> oh, she disappeared again, hold on. Where, oh, oh, this question. I got it, here we go. Kim, your dialogue is always so realistic and snappy in the best way, that's true. How do you write dialogue? Do you act it out in your head? Um, I, I definitely see it for sure. Like I, I see the whole thing as a movie. Um, so I see the, the exchanges and I hear, you know, but I, I definitely see it more than hear it. I have some friends yeah. that are like you know, auditory, um, they're hearing, you know, the whole thing is I, I'm for sure seeing it as I'm doing it, but, but hearing it too, as if it's a, a movie. Um, so that really, um, First of all, thank you, Matoka, for saying my dialogue is snappy. Um, but yeah, so I, I definitely, um, and, and it comes from, I really try to inhabit the characters. It really feels like acting to me. Um, yeah. So I really try to feel, which is again, when you're inhabiting a character not at all like you, it's um, easier. So mm. levels, you're so disconnected from yourself um, and to, to do that. But I really try to like be in their, um, be in their skin. Yeah, okay. What, this is from Nicole Keir, what part or aspect of the book was the most challenging for you to write? The whole book. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> first page. Uh, you know, um, it, that whole book thing is kind of a joke, but it wasn't one thing. It was making all the pieces work. It's like, I, you know, I, I really feel like this is kind of a culmination of very a lot of years of work. Um, this book, um, and I was trying to do a lot of really complicated things, uh, and so it's balancing, you know, those really big themes with the mystery and I, how do you surf that line between, um, you know, for instance, you got to develop characters, but because it's a mystery, you got to develop them fast. Like I don't have a lot of space to like take 10 pages and tell you all about, you know, Sam and how he used to run marathons. I've got to be like, he's got a marathon sticker. He moves it from computer to computer. Like, that's all I can tell you. You know, like I, yeah. that is hard to, to be disciplined that way. Um, and to, to value the mystery in it. Right. Like to, right. it's important. It's fun. You know, like it, it does matter. Um, and it's the spine that keeps the story going. So, um, right. I think trying to do so many things at once was the hardest part. Yeah. Okay. When you were stuck, this is from Harry B. Cook. When you were stuck doing legal writing, did you outline your briefs or did you see this cinematically as well? I don't outline. <laughs> God, I'm like trying to like think back to like my um, the old, old days. I yeah. definitely didn't outline the briefs either. Maybe that made me a terrible lawyer. <laughs> I feel like you're probably supposed to outline that shit. I don't know, that doesn't sound like don't tell any of the clients that I worked for. I don't think I, I've never outlined anything in my life. Like I just don't, it's to me such a mathematical way of breaking down something. I don't know. I just can't, I can't, um, can't connect. I can't see the, the answers to questions um, that way. So no, I don't think I outlined briefs, but again, maybe my life would have been better as a lawyer if I had. <laughs> okay, this is from Helen Zuckerman. Um, domestic thrillers and their related genre, true crime, are and have been thriving in books, TV, and film. What do you think makes these genres so engrossing and appealing to readers today? And what draws you to the genre? Good what question. draws me? Yeah, and first of all, I love true crime too. Like you cannot give me a, a crime thing I will not consume. Um, um, yeah. You know, so I, I think we all want to know why people do things. Um, and I, I think if, particularly if you look at domestic um, suspense or, you know, crime involving relationships and people, it is, I mean, when something really violent and terrible happens, um, that's really just like the most extreme version of a lot of other v violence, right? That doesn't, isn't physical that happens in the, you know, 
hurting of feelings and and betrayal and um and I so I think when we when we look at true crime and when we look at these um, domestic um, suspense stories, we're looking for our own answers about our own situations. Um, at least I know I am. That's why I write them, um, yeah. and I'm really looking for an answer to a question. Um, and the question is always why? Why do you know people betray each other that way? And um, why do they sometimes not? Um, and so I, I think we're all kind of stunned by um, the ways in which people treat each other badly sometimes. And yeah. I think we want to protect ourselves from not being treated that way. Um, and the, there's a maddening um, dearth of answers, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, wh why? Um, and the answer is, you know, I, I know every time I do consume some kind of true crime, I'm like, when are we going to get to the answer of why? So that I know that that's not going to happen to me <laughs> that you know that my husband's not going to do that to me or my you know my child is going to do that um and th th rarely are those answers because we want some sort of certainty right like out of all of our relationships exactly yeah um this is from andrew gallo what is what are the what is the best and the worst aspect of releasing a book during quarantine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there are, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I have to say, um, it was super stressful. First of all, qu quarantine sucks just in yeah. general. Yeah. So like, okay, so like all of our lives kind of suck under quarantine. So let's just take that as a baseline. Yeah. Um, I would say that I have lost, you, you lose, one of the most special things about launching a book is, um, there's so much um, uncertainty in publishing. Um, things succeed, things fail. Like you're you're going to be a huge success. No, you're a total failure. Like two days later, like it, it's just reality of the. It's like right. the casino. Um, yep. So the one thing you can count on, really, with a book, unlike a lot of other writing, where if you like write a screenplay, you never know if you're ever going to see it. But with a book, it's going to come out. And it's and you're going to hold it in your hands and you're going to stand in a bookstore and you're going to look at people and you're going to talk to them and you're going to sign it and you're going to hand it to them. Right. Um, and so that's a really special thing like that moment. And I think spe especially because as writers, you work alone so much. Um, and I think being able to connect with people in that way and, and at that moment where, yeah, it's a celebratory moment, but it's also like this meaningful, impactful moment, I think for most writers. I mean, do you agree? Is that that's oh, like a, I mean, so, it's a big, it's a big it's, thing. Yeah, and you see people that you haven't seen for years. And it's just really nice to connect. Yeah, it's really, you finally kind of like, it's like your moment at the office, you know, right. like we're at the, your birthday party at the office. And um, <laughs> so uh, that is a loss, like a real yeah. loss, you know? Yeah. And um, so I feel that. Um, but I will say um, that I am getting the hang of this virtual event and sure. I am much less nervous because I am under the impression I am just talking to you. That's right. <laughs> and that is awesome yeah. because yeah. I can't tell how bored people are. I don't see anybody on their phone. All of my friends who like have this on and are like, I'm going to pretend I stayed the whole time, but I didn't. Um, I don't know what they're doing and it doesn't matter. Um, so. <laughs> I, that's great. And actually there's been all these opportunities, um, so many more, like I, I feel as a, you know, because people scrambled, there was this like kind of gasp in the industry where people were moving publication dates and, and it was like, what are we going to do? And I um, you know, and I'm lucky enough to write in a genre where it's not really about in-person events. You know, I, you know, I'm not a high literary book. I'm not a nonfiction book. Um, my book isn't really sold, um, in events. So it, it it wasn't going to be a critical loss for me. Um, so that's, um, but it is, it is, I will not lie, like just dealing with the tech as we were joking before we came on, like all of us having to adjust the tech. Um, yeah. I didn't get to get my hair done before I did any of this. You know, I usually buy a pair of shoes. Right. Um, you know, like we're just, whatever. Those are tiny things. You know, my yeah. family, they, my book came out, you know, right. um, but right. it's definitely, it's an, ad, it's an added layer. And I, I'll miss not having had that that launch yeah. for this whole round. I'm sure. Well, um, last question, um, and it's a good one to end on. Can you give us a sneak peek of the next frontier uh, frontier of your next book, or is that anathema to the process? Or what is your brain wrapped around right now? That's from Mary Colart. Um, yeah, no, I can talk about my next book. Um, 
the one that's totally finished and is so good and perfect. Yeah. Um, ready to be handed in any second. Um, so uh, it is about a bunch of um, troubled college friends um, who reunite for a weekend. They live in New York City. They head upstate for the weekend to yeah. the Catskills. Um, and once they get up there, um, they kind of run afoul of some of the locals, um, kind of a mixing between the the locals and the, the hipsters coming up for the weekend. Um, and uh -oh. things, you know, violence erupts. But um, in the end, the question becomes whether or not, you know, where the truth threat lies, whether or not it's with that that conflict or the threat is closer to home. Um, so uh, that's the basic outline of it. Um, but it's already changing. And I will say that like, when I first, part of what I got to figure out very early on is the structure. And again, it's got this kind of orchestral structure again. Um, and uh, I introduced a um, police, uh, like Lizzie, uh, the kind of uh, a police officer to look in and it's got an interesting structure where, the book opens and the thing has already happened, right? So you're, but you're also seeing it unfold simultaneously. Um, okay. So uh, anyway, I introduced her and she did like hijack the book a little bit. Um, like she's a great character and her own story. I knew also like when I introduced, I never want somebody just to be introduced as a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna introduce that character, that character has to link back, right? In some meaningful way um, to the rest of the story, which is I think another thing that helps it not be, you know, predictable or whatever. Like there's, there's never anybody there for no reason or their story right. doesn't, doesn't matter. So, um, right. but yeah, even talking about it now, I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah, that's a book's a mess right now. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to fix it. It's going to be fine, um, yep. but I'm still working on it. That's great. Well, thank you, Kim. I think that is all the time we have. Kim back. Cool. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This was so much fun. Uh, Kim, to your point, I, the these virtual events are so strange. You just got your you guys are just hanging out. There's yes. just an intangibleness to it that's so much fun. Um, but again, thank you guys so much for doing this with us and bearing with all the tests and and technical issues. And I, uh, on my end, everything was crisp and clear. Um, just as a reminder, if you buy a book from us down on this purchase the book here button, um, Kim will be sending you a tote. And uh, we will be getting her that information this week. So um, you could also just head to our website and anytime in the next couple of days, place an order and uh, we will have that. The book is in Laura's hands. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in uh, and have a lovely night. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye.